I am honored to present my studies um, in this seminar and special thanks to, to my students Monica and Ekaterina for sharing their results and for presenting um, their work. The topic of my presentation is how natural is the nature, paleoecological investigations to the formation of cultural landscapes. So there is no doubt that the modern landscapes are product of natural processes and human land use. And the recent growth in human population and its impact on the planet has led to an introduction of a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. However, uh, we know that um, the process of active modification of environment is uh, connected to uh, different cultures, to their a birth, flourishing, and fall uh, of a specific culture. And all, only paleoecological perspectives can shed light on the origin and changes of supposedly natural ecosystems. And this is the topic of my uh, of major, major part of my work, uh, where I'm dealing with the questions, uh, what is the origin of the modern landscapes? Uh, when did they form? And what was the role of humans in this process? I, in my talk, I would like to first to give you an introduction to palynology and um, uh, as a tool for reconstructing of vegetation changes. And then we will uh, go to case studies. I decided to give you four case studies. Uh, one, the first will be Eastern Mediterranean, where I will uh, tell you the results of my investigations in Elia and Ainos. Uh, then we will switch to uh, the Gorgon Plain, uh, and after so uh, the Gorgon Plain, I will talk about Sasanian Empire, and then we will go to Kungur Forest Steppe, where, where I and Monica will present you our project, um, and uh, at the end we will go to the East European Forest Steppe, and uh, Katarina will tell you about this project and first results. So we will start with the introduction in palynology. Uh, what is pollen, first of all? Pollen is a fine to coarse powdery substance comprising pollen grains, which are male gametophytes of seed plants. Quite complicated uh, for non-biologists. Uh, but yes, during pollination, pollen grains are transferred from male part of plant, so here you can see it, to the female part of plant uh, for fertilization. This is not the process which we are studying in paleo, uh, palynology, but it's important to know. Uh, the most important part for us, of course, is morphology. So you can see on these examples, the pollen grains look completely different if they belong, belong to different plants like uh, oak or fir, juniper, lime tree. You can see by morphology, we can identify uh, this uh, genera. Sometimes we can identify even species. And in most cases, we can identify a family like Poesia. Well, how does it work in paleoecology? Um, um, let's imagine uh, one time frame. Uh, we can see, yeah, it is vegetation is there, plants are flowering. Every year they release pollen. Pollen are transported everywhere, falling to the um, soil and getting decomposed, or they're falling down to a lake or a pit bog and getting preserved. Uh, if um, in the next period of time, vegetation changed for whatever reason, and the plants are still uh, producing pollen grains and the, it's still going to the lake or to our archive and getting preserved. In the next period of time, the same. So actually plants are flowering, which we should remember this and uh, our, our archive is growing. At one point of time, we are coming, paleoecologists, palynologists, and uh, take this archive. Then we can study pollen assemblages uh, in any period of time and based on these pollen assemblages uh, interpret vegetation say which kind of vegetation was growing at what period and uh, also these changes in vegetation will explain will show us some um, yeah some triggers maybe uh, climate or fire or human can be a trigger of these changes and this is our 
task to interpret these um, triggers. Well, in these archives, not only pollen are preserved, but also non-pollen palynomorphs, uh, which are, so you see on this picture, a huge amount, variety of these forms. Um, non-pollen palynomorphs, these are objects between 10 to 20 micrometers, so basically it's a size range of pollen grains. They are resistant to laboratory treatment and present fragments of algae, plants, fungi, animals, or stages of their life cycle. In most cases, we don't know the taxonomy, uh, but uh, we know that, uh, well, in cases which we can identify and we know uh, that they are important indicators for eutrophication, diseases, pasture, erosion, and so on. You will see it uh, soon in uh, some examples. Well, how does it work, palynology? Uh, the most exciting part of this, maybe, um, after we get a um, research question, then we are going to, for field work. Our archives are normally pit box or lakes, but we also can study archaeological deposits. Um, uh, after this, we are going to subsampling of our cores or profiles. We can do it even in the field or in the lab. Then we go with our samples to the laboratory and uh, um, yeah, make quite harsh treatment of our samples with different acids um, in order to uh, dilute sedim sediments like carbonates. We don't need them silicates. We don't need them organic. And only pollen grain should remain and also non-pollen palynomorphs, of course. So when we got our uh, pollen samples as clean as possible, we are going to our microscope and starting counting. This part takes the most, most uh, time of our job. So let's say 50% we are microscoping all the time. Um, um, yes, and after we counted our um, samples, uh, we make pollen diagrams. Today you will see several pollen diagrams, so it's important that you understand what you see. I can explain you. So here we have normally a uh, normal way is um, presentation of pollen diagram by percentages of individual taxa, which you see here on um, X axis. Yes, so each taxa and it's written uh, on top which taxa uh, is changing now. So these are percentages by every in every sector um very important that we have um this ap these are arboreal pollen or pollen coming from trees and shrubs and nap non-arboreal pollen so this core we will see many many times today uh important to know so you can you can see here here trees and here uh, herbs uh also important that y uh, sorry y epsilon x y epsilon uh, axis is um represent depth or age so and we should also know that the oldest samples are uh, at the bottom and the modern are on top so when you imagine your archive basically uh, this is uh, the way we are presenting yeah okay and after we creating our diagram come the most interesting part interpretation and here exactly here we can tell different stories so let's go to the first uh, example, to our first story, to Eastern Mediterranean. And here I would like to show you uh, studies in Elia and Ainos, and I will start with Elia. You have, uh, well, two weeks ago it was a presentation, very nice, about Elia and surroundings, yes, to Pergamon um, and ar around, in surroundings of Pergamon. And today, yeah, I will explain you my studies and show the results. Uh, so I don't need to explain so much. Pergamon is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it was a um, capital of the Kingdom of Pergamon in antiquity. You see very beautiful archaeological remains. I visited this place. It's a fantastic place to visit. It was a touristic place. Um, yeah, and Pergamon, uh, as we know uh, from the presentation as well, uh, two weeks ago, Pergamon 
was located on the hills and um, as uh, um, many or almost all important um, cities in antiquity it has a harbor and this harbor is Elia. so here we did our investigations in the harbor of Pergamon. Uh, on this picture um, you can see the harbor itself and the core which I was studied was taken from from the middle about the middle of this uh, harbor. The harbor was uh, formed well was built in Eight, um, 280 BC and close to this harbor of course was the city of Elia. Well um, this was a project where I was involved by, by Helmut was led by Helmut Bruckner and uh, Martin Zeliger um, made many corings here around so and I got one of these. Um, what do we know about um, Elia? So, okay, it was a harbor um, of Pergamon, but Elia also meets, means in Greek olives. So we can imagine that olives were very important um, in during this Elia city was functioning or harbor was functioning. Also, the same we can see from the coins. You see the coins are depict uh, on on coins olive twigs are depicted as well. Uh, but we wanted to know more. Uh, vegetation changes and environmental changes were unknown uh, in this region. So here you can see uh, the modern picture uh, I took when I, during excursion there. So we see the, the city of Elia doesn't exist anymore. It, there is a hill covered by olive plantations and we have a silted harbor covered by salt marshes with salicornia. Sometimes it's covered by water, sometimes not. So you can see the you know, on the next picture. And the, our goal was to trace vegetation and environmental changes uh, in relation to human activities in the Bay of Elia. Uh, this is, as I said, so was taken. The core was taken here. You can see another impression uh, of this um, of the harbor. We have Western Mall, we have Southern Mall, and uh, the way to the sea. Yes, so if we are looking from the uh, from the city, here people are uh, taking core, marking Zeliga. Uh, this is the core, Ella 70, which I studied, um, and uh, there is interpretation of faces interpretation. Uh, below we have bedrock, then shallow marine environment, and the uh, upper part is lagoon environment. We have a, also a very nice age depth model. And um, let's see uh, what's happened with our vegetation. Um, which our pollen records show that between 5600 and uh, 850 BC, open oak forest with machia and some olives were presented. So you see dominant of uh, quercus, dominant of oak, as well as uh, about 20% of pine. And we also see that olives were presented here uh, from the beginning of our record at least. Um, at about 850 BC, we see a strong deforestation event. You see the pollen of trees, this arboreal pollen decrease, basically mainly it's uh, because of oak. And uh, also olive cultivation started here and continued later, especially during, uh, after harbor was co constructed, you see it by this uh, red arrow. Uh, we have the maximum of olives. Maybe they even planted it close to the harbor, we don't know, but we have quite a large amount of this pollen in, in the spectrum. Uh, we also uh, see uh, cerealia increasing a little, so we have agriculture uh, in surroundings and also pasture in, in, indicated by machia. Uh, after uh, Elia was not uh, well, was abandoned uh, more or less, or it was not harbor anymore because of siltation processes. From 180 to 800 AD, we see a reforestation of areas of so pine increase, oaks increase, uh, olives de decrease, but they didn't disappear uh, from from this uh, region, from this area, and also pasture is still there, indicated by machia. Uh, Later, then we have, uh, you see this um, gray 
um, line, this is a hiatus, so it means that we miss some um, sedimentation, some sediment, we don't know why, why uh, but it's not here, so we have a very strong uh, in indication um, it was no, almost no pine and now it's quite a lot and also some reworked pollen are there, so some sediment uh, is missing here. And we see that the, this part, the upper part, well, we don't know exactly when, but after 8, 000, 800 AD to the present, uh, a cure spread of pine forests and also decrease, strong decrease in um, oak forests. And only to modern time, we have again olives, um, as well as Maca is presented and also Hinapodiaceae indicating uh, south marsh development. So basically, this um, is very nice presentation of today landscapes, which I um, showed you the, on the picture. Uh, well, from this pollen record, what did we learn? We learned that olives were present in the region uh, since the last 7,000 years. Olive cultivation in Elia started at about uh, 850 BC and continued until 800 AD, coinciding with Machia development. After a break, olive cultivation started again in the recent times. It's not only olives what we uh, can learn about vegetation. We can also um, get some insights in, well, yeah, contribute to some discussions, botanical discussions. As Schwartz and Lewis, for example, signified pine uh, forests or Pinus brutia forests with Clerophyllus understory as climax formation typical for the Mediterranean zone. And another scientist, Walter and Zohari, they argued that uh, pine forests represent a degradation stage of the Machia and the broad leaf summer green forest. This is uh, what we, uh, from our paleoecological um, investigations, can answer. So our data reveal that spread of pine occurred after a long-lasting human impact of uh, more than 1,000 years with enhanced soil erosion uh, due to forest clearing, intensive agriculture and pasture. And the uh, land use, which I'm talking here about this uh, soil erosion and, and the agriculture uh, uh, and pasture basically and the erosion, we can infer from non-pollen palynomores. Um, one of the important indicator, um, especially for pasture, are coprophilus fungal spores. So you see here, this is a very nice picture. Um, mm, fungus growing on dung release its spores. Spores are sticky and they stick to grass uh, and are getting eaten by animals or by herbivores, a sheep in this case, going through intestine, going out, of course, uh, on dung and growing again. So they sporulate and the cycle um, um, repeated again and again. If you look at dunk a little closer, so we can see a very beautiful dunk scape, uh, many, many beautiful um, fungi growing on dunk. And some of uh, spores of this fungi we can identify. You can see it here on top, Sporomiella, Podospora, Sarcobulus delicia. And uh, by amount of these spores in our sediment, we can infer pastoral activities. Uh, so you can see it here in orange, uh, spores of coprophyllous fungi were very few at the beginning and then when people arriving and starting deforestation, they are obviously also starting to use this uh, area for pasture. Especially high percentages we have after Elia was abandoned, as, uh, so it was not functioning as harbor anymore, the area was even more strongly used for pasture. Um, another important um, indicator uh, are spores of glomus type so-called or glomeromycota. Um, glomus or glomeromycota are mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, they are growing on the roots of plants and if we find them in our lacustrine or marine environment we can say that uh, they occur there because of soil erosion. So basically they are indicators of soil erosion. And you see here, we have also some soil erosion from the beginning, then uh, deforestation, we have increasing in soil erosion. During Elia, uh, 
functioning as harbor, we have very low soil erosion. So possibly people were protecting the shore of, of, of the harbor. Uh, that's why we don't have this uh, soil sediment in, in input in the sediment. And then when uh, a line was not um, functioning anymore, uh, the soil erosion increasing even. So also this correlates very well with increasing pastoral activities. Uh, we can also see fire events. So, in and of course, as we also imagine, during Elia Harbor, we have the major fires, um, fire, fire, uh, charcoal particles in the sediment. Uh, another imp interesting indicators are hel eggs of helminth eggs, so of intestinal parasites. These are worms living in us and eating us from inside. Um, we can see that where they were also present uh, here during the all the time but in elia it, they increase even so they are indicate in, indicate they can indicate two things one is uh, hygienic conditions so if we see this course it means that people were had these diseases it means that they simply didn't wash their hands yeah so in our corona world it's <laughs> maybe also uh, yeah quite interesting Maybe we can also see it somehow one day for our researcher, how we didn't wash our hands and, uh, and so on, um, contributing to this spread of Corona. Uh, okay, coming back to Elia, um, increase this such increase in uh, eggs in the harbor can also speak for canalization so that uh, we have some water from canalization coming to the river and maybe somehow uh, coming to the harbor as well. Uh, also, uh, hydrology is important uh, part. So, um, foraminiferal linings indicate very well um, marine environment uh, here at the beginning, uh, and then they disappear. And also, dinoxys, the cyst of uh, algae, of dinoflagellate, the dinoflagellates um, indicate that it was marine environment. Um, um, at first, we have uh, autotrophic dinoxys, and then they, the assemblage changed to heterotrophic dinoxys, um, showing uh, eutrophication conditions. So we get also it correlates also very well with these intestinal parasites eggs. Uh, one of very exciting finding for me was um, Peridinium ponticum. This is a dinocyst uh, endemic to the brackish Black Sea and Marmara Sea with mesotrophic and eutrophic upper water conditions. Uh, we, uh, I found this dinocyst during the phase of Elia functioning as harbor. Um, and uh, then they disappear also, you can see. Yes, there are not so many finds, but then they disappear. And we interpret this um, occurrence as a diversion of the Black Sea dinoflagellate cysts by ship transport. So, of course, uh, without purpose, people brought this with built water or ballast stones, possibly, and population could, could uh, stay uh, in this harbor um, for a yeah, few hundred years. To summarize this uh, study, um, since 5600 BC, open oak and fine forest existed, which were lumbered by humans since 850 BC. Foraminiferal linings and autotrophic dinocysts reveal marine conditions at this time. Between 850 BC and 800 AD, the landscape was used for agriculture and pasture. The most intensive arboricultural activity with olea, pistachia, uh, grapes, and walnuts occurred between 170 BC and 180 AD, corresponding to the period of functioning Elias Harbor. After construction of moles, water conditions changed to more eutrophic, possibly due to increased erosion and canalization. There is an evidence of the Black Sea species diversion by sh shipping transport. And uh, after 800 AD or later, the harbor was silted up and uh, anthropogenic activity declined. Vegetation recovered mainly by pine and to the present salt marshes and olea cultivation uh, in surrounding areas are evident. 
yes, these are uh, in quite interesting insights in the very, very strong um, influence of humans on environment in Elia. And similar um, impact we see also in INOS. I will show you uh, this study as well. It's still preliminary results, but I will, uh, but it's very exciting results. So, you know, INOS, and, uh, I was working there with Anka uh, and Helmut Brücken as well, and I got a core from Martin Zelika, uh, which I'm studying, so this IN50. IN so, you can see the surroundings of um, INOS. We have a pine plantation, crop fields, oak forest, markia on shore where pasture take place, and also uh, this is Galagulu Lake, rice fields and river valley. And here are some impressions of the coring site, uh, markia vegetation, yes, very um, um, dry vegetation, pasture at Galagulu or pine plantations, also oak forest on hills. And uh, yeah, if we go in closer, we see where the core was taken at Tashat Le Um This is a core, also very nice. The uh, sediment, uh, sedimentary record was, was already published. Uh, we have very nice HDEP model here as well. And uh, the first results of palynology shows um, quite similar con um, history like in Elia. So we have seven from 7,000 to 5,000 BC open oak forest with, with pine and hazel as well as machia. From uh, in 4,700 to 2,800 BC open mixed forest, uh, open mixed oak forest with ulm, lint, hornbeam and beech as well as machia and uh, as well as agriculture we can uh, see. You see this by cerealia, some increase. Um, 800 BC to 200 AD, uh, deforestation and agriculture uh, take place. You see a very sharp decline in oak, as well as increase, strong decrease in fires and spread of salt marshes indicated by Henopodiaceae. And from 1400 to the modern time, uh, we see only oak remains or forest remains. Uh, dominance of pine, um, in development of salt, salt marsh, marshes, um, olive, some olives cultivation, but not so many, not so many, not so much like in uh, Elia. Um, to environmental history, um, NPP inform us. So we see that the most of non pollen polynomorphs are presented by algae and fungi. Um, here we see marine environment and in the lower part, then sil siltation process, but also some eutrophication. And uh, from 100 to 1800 AD, uh, brackish water and strong eutrophication indicated by cyanobacteria, also soil erosion and some feces coming to, to this lake. The upper sample, the upest sample, is um, ter indicate terrestrial environment, so all um, algae disappearing. Um, to conclude these both studies, um, we can say that long-lasting human activity led to turnover of vegetation formations in eastern Mediterranean from deciduous oak forests to pine forests, which are dominating now, uh, if it's not agriculture. Human activities during the antiquity strongly influenced the nature. Strong deforestation, agriculture, arboriculture, pasture, increased soil erosion, presence of canalization, and consequent eutrophication of water bodies. Um, in case of Elia, maritime connection to the Black Sea is traced by invasion of an alien dinosaur species. Um, yeah, to after learning of such large um impact of human on the vegetation and environment in eastern mediterranean we will go to gorgon plain and uh, here um i will talk about sasanian woodland use in treeless landscapes so you see the landscapes absolutely treeless but there are some plantations of course but um, nature plantation uh, naturally they are uh, empty so like a desert um the study i uh, performed due to my involvation in the arc project persia and its neighbors 
this project was led by Eberhard Sauer from uh, University of Edinburgh. He's professor there. Um, so it was the project from 2012 to 2018. It's closed now and we are still publishing the last reports of two big books about Gorgon Plain. From Caucasus, we already published this, uh, the results. Uh, okay, so Sasanian Empire, uh, you know, it was the empire from 3rd to 7th century AD. It stretched from Mesopotamia to the west um, uh, of the Indian from Mesopotamia uh, to the west of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, the empire was quite huge, <laughs> large empire, and uh, uh, some borders uh, were studied during this project. One of these is on Gordon Plain, so which I am going to talk about today. Uh, Gorgon Plain, what is interesting, uh, well, there is one interesting find, this is a Gorg the Gorgon Wall, which is Sasanian era defense system against nomads in the north. Uh, the Gorgon wall is also called as Red Snake. And um, yeah, the project was about um, environment, um, well, not only environment, of course, it was archaeological project, but we also investigate in environmental history. Uh, to talk a little, to say a little about Gorgon uh, Plain itself, um, the Gorgon Plain is located between Arbors, uh, Albors Mountains uh, in the south and the Turkmen Steppe in the north. So it, it has uh, distinct climate zones um, uh, with the uh, rainforest in the northern Al Albors, uh, then well watered Gorgon Plain with fertile soils and desert steppe in the, in the distance of foothills. There is also a strong gradient from um, west to the east uh, because moisture is coming from the Caspian Sea and the closer to the Caspian Sea, of course, uh, Gorgon get more uh, moisture, we have about 515 millimeter and Gonbak Kavus uh, 360 millimeters, so it's further to the east. Um, corresponding to these uh, zones, to these climatic zones, there are different land use zones. Um, you can see it here. So cultivation is uh, um, carried well is is used um, um, in on the Gorgon Plain itself. So in these fertile fertile soils, where we have enough moisture, and further uh, behind the Gorgon River, which is here in blue. Uh, we see that basically grazing, uh, well, the landscapes are using uh, basically for grazing. Um, I did some investigations, several investigations. One of these is paleontological investigations on Cor Congor Lake. So you see this is a very small lake, 80 to 200 meters. Uh, it's a temporary lake, so in summer uh, it's quite well without water so here people um, my colleagues from Exxon Provence they took the core in 2007 you see uh, it's dry I visited this area in 2014 uh, and uh, we see uh, even more water and also that people could um, get some fish from there so maybe they do um, breeding fish breeding there um, age gap model of course we have and uh, the story so here we see um, uh, on this moisture index, which is um, calculated from the main pollen taxa, we see an increase in regional humidity between 700 BC and 1300 AD, uh, where our record is um, finishing, during the period uh, when the Persian empires were expanded, and of course also uh, Islamic period is here. Um, very important finding that, uh, in like in contrast to uh, Elia and Ainos, we we see here that open steppe landscapes were presenting all the time. So during the last six thousand thousand years, um, but uh, some uh, deforestation of Urkanian forest can be suggested since uh, seven hundred BC as well as agriculture, uh, pasture, and arboriculture, at least seven, uh, since 700 BC. 
So you see here cultivated trees like vitis, uh, so grapes, walnut, plat platan tree, plain tree, platanus, castania, uh, morus alba, and also uh, pasture indicators. Uh, so our pollen data obtained suggest a locally dry period between 4000 and 2000 BC and then increase in regional humidity afterwards with a maximum between 700 BC and 1300 AD during the period when Persian empires were expanding. The eastern part of the Gorgon Plain was characterized by open steppe landscapes during the last 6000 years. Uh, it was used for pasture and agriculture um, since 700 BC, as well as deforestation is seen since uh, 700 BC. And the strongest anthropogenic impact on the environment around the Congor site is documented uh, during the Parthian and Sasanian empires. Um, we also investigate, well, we, I did also investigations in anthrop uh, using anthropology. I got uh, samples from archaeologists from all these uh, different sites, um, charcoal samples. The anthropology is the analysis and identification of charcoal, which is preserved after carbonization based on wood anatomy. So you can see on these pictures uh, some different um, genera um, or other groups like monocots um, with very specific morphology. So you can identify it using a microscope. Uh, different uh, gen genera of, of trees. Uh, what do we get from this? Which results do we get? Um, we have, um, um, I studied fuel for kilns. So kilns are, uh, there are about a thousand of brick kilns were built along the construction of the wall. Why? Because the wall is made of these um, bricks. You can see it on the picture. They're quite big, about 20 kilograms each, and uh, 200 million bricks were needed to construct the Gorgon Wall. If we look at charcoal assemblages uh, from these kilns, we see that the dry vegetation uh, genera dominate, and actually uh, the local arid vegetation was used for um, burning in these kilns. If we go uh, analyze the kiln from closer to the to the forest we see also more uh, forest genera as well as cultivated taxa. Um, another um, uh, picture we see from fortifications. So, for example, Fort 4 uh, had about 2,000 persons um, were, who were accommodating there, so they need um, charcoal, they need wood for um, cooking or for heating. And uh, you can see that the, it's, the charcoal assemblage is dominated by um, arid um, genera, so it also local wood, wood is used, but also there is supply from uh, Hyrcanian mountains. A similar picture we have from uh, Fort 2. Uh, yeah, here you see a picture from excavation. Uh, it was a, a storage room with 12 vessels and storage piece all went in fireplaces there. Um, and also assemblage again dominates by arid taxa and just some supply from Herkranian forest. Uh, and similar is in Burak Tape, and also if you go closer to the uh, Alberts Mountains, um, we see a quite large amount then of um, Herkranian taxa in Banzaran Fort, for example, which was functioning as a palace or other high status monument. So here we uh, have a dominance of um, Hyrcanian taxa, of, of, of this forest taxa. Uh, we studied also fuel in domestic contexts, and here we see also quite large amount of arid taxa and uh, some supply uh, from Alpers Mountains. In similar is a fuel in the city of Dashkale. Dashkale um, was the largest city of the Sasanian air. Uh, population around uh, 100,000 inhabitants. Here we see also the dominance of Hyrcanian taxa and cultivated taxa. And interesting that today uh, this uh, city is located in three less landscapes. So it was uh, worth to bring uh, wood from forests to, to this uh, city or maybe 
um, forests were coming closer to, to the city at that time. We don't know. Um, to summarize this uh, data, the anthropological data show that during the Sasanian period, uh, local sources provided enough firewood for kilns in short time use, but were insufficient for fortifications, which required additional supplies from the Hyrcanian forests. This forest provided the main source of firewood for sites located close to the Arbors Mountains. And they also did the investigation by botanical macro remains. So we, I studied seeds and uh, fruits of um, plants in the sediment. In this Sarisu River Valley, the most interesting site, uh, most interesting results. These are, you can see on the picture, remains of artificial water reservoir. So water reservoir was here, and we could um, study uh, the sediment located from deposited during this reservoir. Uh, it has quite large amount of seeds and fruits. And if we look at these assemblages, we can say uh, the reservoir, this water reservoir, was um, quiet water uh, with many plants, water plants inside. Uh, close to this uh, water was Salicornia salt marshes um, um, spread and also reed assemblages. Um, fig tree was growing there and um, grapes and also copper um, maybe on the on the bridge itself. So you can see there is quite different picture from what we have now. So, and if we imagine that such sites were um, more often occurring more often in the past, so during Sasanian era, so these small paradises we can imagine. Um, altogether, my investigations show that uh, during Sasanian Empire in the Gorman Plains, uh, several trees were cultivated for fruits. We had walnut, olive, pistachio, grapes, chestnut, date, plum, fig, and uh, white mulberry. Uh, for recreation, could pla plain tree, black and white mulberry could be used. And uh, we have a hypothesis that uh, white mulberry was used for silk production because this is um, more, more alva uh, is very important for silk because um, silk worms are fed on, on these leaves and they produce basically the uh, fibers, well, fibers producing people, of course, but um, taking it from uh, silk worm cocoons. Um, there is a, according to a legend, the history of seal began in 2640 when um, Empress, um, Chinese Empress accidentally discovered silk filament when a cocoon fell in a boiling hot cup of tea. Um, then you know um, about establishment of the silk road, it was important. Um, trade and the silk was a trade of course the, the major part of this trade it's also going through this gorgon plain and silk arrived uh, the secret uh, of producing silk arrived to the europe in the mid of 6th century ad uh, there is another legend that two monks uh, with support of the byzantine emperor justinian i successfully smuggled silk worm eggs into the byzantine empire um, this led to establishment of indigenous um, Byzantine silk industry. And uh, in our uh, core, in the Congo Lake core, I uh, found the Morus alba um, pollen grains as well as seeds uh, corresponding to the, this era of Sasanian. Uh, this, so we think maybe it was um, already during Sasanian uh, period, Morus alba. Uh, was there and maybe they also knew the secret of seal production. Uh, for sure, uh, during Islamic period, um, the secret was already there. So the, the, the people produced produce silk in Gorman Wall. We know it also from um, historian, uh, historical sources um, from Arabic geographers, Yakubi and Istakhli. Uh, to summarize this, um, work this um, this part of, 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 of my studies. Uh, compilation of paleobotanical data provide major new insights into, into woodland management 
in the treeless landscapes of the Gorban Plain during the Sasanian era. Palynological research points to natural origins of the steppe landscape, of the steppe vegetation on the Gorban Plain. During the Sasanian period, local sources provided enough firewood for kilns in short time use, but were insufficient for, for fortifications, as I could show, and the uh, Hyrcanian forests were used for this. Cultivation of trees was widespread during the Sasanian Empire for fruits, shadow, and possibly more culture for seal production. Um, now we will go to the north a little bit to my um, place, my home place, basically to Perm, and um, talk about the project and Kungur Forest Steppe. Uh, the project is um, financed by DFG and Kungur Forest Steppe. What is interesting in this uh, in this forest steppe, it's at the um, the most northern European forest steppe island. So you can see it on this map. This um, this is the area of forest steppe, which is located in Sub Taiga. So in Hemi Boreal Forest. Uh, it is located there because of basically because of uh, geology. We have lower Permian gypsum, dolomites, and carbonites, uh, which uh, allow uh, growing of uh, dry vegetation, more dry vegetation, of steppic vegetation. You can see it also on some pictures now. So this is Hemi Boreal Forest or Sub Taiga. We have spruce and fir and birches and this dark unfriendly forests and if we are going to the uh, Kungur forest steppe we uh, we see birch and poplar park forests uh, they are very open and light and very friendly you know um, as well as pine forests are growing there basically uh, in some places we can also find slopes with the steppe vegetation very species rich and very um, nice vegetation but uh, today Agriculture covers about 50% of the landscapes and forested areas about 10 to 20%. It's very difficult to imagine uh, how was this, how would be these landscapes without humans. And uh, uh, to this, there is a long discussions over 100 years um, about the origin and formation of the Kungur forest steppe. The first hypothesis said that this is um, anthropogenic uh, nature. So uh, basically it was a steppe landscape during the glacial. Then with the beginning of the Holocene, we have forested, like sub taiga is coming and developing. And only due to uh, anthropogenic impact, uh, due to deforestation uh, spread of steppe elements could happen uh, in, so basically in the most more or less recent time. Another hypothesis said that uh, during the glacial, it was um, steppe and forest steppe environment. Uh, and this forest steppe remained during the whole Holocene and also in only in the um, recent time also happened deforestation or with humans or not. But important is that they say during the mid Holocene, we had uh, um, all the time this forest steppe. Um, Professor Agosnov um, wrote an article, in to, published an article in 2009, and he uh, said, uh, well, the article title is Kungur Forest Steppe Phenomenon or Phantom. I was inspired by this uh, publication and also by my previous um, um, studies, basically. And I uh, wrote the project uh, Phenomenon of the Kungur Forest Steppe, Natural or Human Made. And here we um, investigate in the question Does vegetation history of Kungur Forest Steppe differ from the Hemiboreal forests? Did forest or forest steppe dominate the landscapes during the Holocene? And what is the human role in formation of the Kungur Forest Steppe? Of course, talking about um, humans, we need to say about archaeology, and the Ural was. Um, inhabited since early Paleolithic, but the most important uh, populations like spread of um, human activities and the uh, amount of sites increase um, rapidly during the Iron Age, especially Gladenova culture is very important and very famous there. So it's important and famous by this animal style. Um, and later also Nivolina, which is was spread uh, widely in Kungur forest steppe. 
So we did many corings. I will show you some, well, shortly results from Spassky Agora, and then we, uh, Monica will uh, tell us about Winske Balota. So Spassky Agora is a natural reserve for protection of Kungur forest steppe organized in 1965. Uh, it has many species of plants and about 30% of them are um, forest steppe species. Um, if we look at the map, so you see here about 44% in green it's forests and um, yellow and orange are uh, steppe and meadows. Uh, if you go a little closer, uh, I studied this lake uh, Krugle, uh, we took a core and the core was taken in March 2018, it was quite cold, uh, minus 10 and yeah, it's beautiful landscapes of Mm, Kungur forest step with birches you see here. Um, in summer, it, it's more uh, it's more friendly landscapes. Yeah, you see it's very nice lake. You want to swim there or fish. Um, we have a also nice uh, HDAP model um, um, and see that uh, our sediment um, cover just three and a half thousand years, unfortunately. Um, the results vegetation. Uh, well, pollen, pollen records show that uh, between 1400 to 100 BC, uh, forests um, were dominating the, these landscapes. They were quite open forests, I should say. It's more open than taiga forests. Then we have a deforestation phase corresponding to Iron Age and migration period. So we see here deforestation, you see a strong decline in pine. Um, uh, we have our um, agriculture uh, indicated by cereal type fires and soil erosion. And uh, uh, from thousand years, from thousand AD to modern time, we see a spread of forest again, but also some settlement phases. Uh, with the last one is well, this one as well correspond to Russian colonization. Um, so these are results from uh, Spaska Gara. So you, we can see that um, landscapes are getting op more open uh, during the human due to human impact. And now we will switch to Uinske Balota, and uh, Monica will tell us uh, more about this. For the orientation, we are still in the Congo Forest Step, and after these interesting insights into the human impact in the northern part of the Congo Forest Step, we now travel to its uh, southwestern edge. Um, to be precise, the Maya of Unskoye um, is 10 kilometers away from the um, Forest Step. Uh, the Maya of Unskoye is nowadays a protected landscape to shelter natural Maya transition areas on river terraces in the lowlands. And in this case, it is located on the riverbank of the river Aspa. It covers an area of uh, over 680 hectares. And the closest uh, village is Uinskoye, which is one kilometer away. And this is also name giving for the core. Um, there's a lack of archaeological data and excavations in the area besides uh, the river terraces of the major streams. Uh, like the Kama River. Uh, so this data may reveal some potential for local research. Uh, in the center of the Maya, where the core was taken in 2019, is a mesotrophic pine birch peat forest with ongrowing reed. This is bordered in the map with a beige line. This forest is surrounded by a mixed linden forest, uh, which is at mixed with um, species like the Siberian fir, Abies sabirica, and this is highlighted with a white line in the map. On the picture, you can get an impression of the coring location, and six samples were extracted from the core for radiocarbon dating. And these uh, revealed a paleoecological record of 9,600 years. In the pollen diagram, uh, a dominance of the local Maya veg forest vegetation is obvious. Um, you can see it on the, um, the dark green. 
and, but nevertheless, maxima of open vegetation parts are recognizable. So we can detect maxima of more open character of the landscape between uh, 7,000 years BCE and 7,600 7, 7, years BCE and 7,000 years BCE, as well as around 2,000 years BCE and 500 years CE and during the last 500 years. On the basis of the pollen data, a biomization was applied and the predominant biomes were calculated. These are the taiga, the cold coniferous forest and the cold mixed forest. First, verifiable increased distribution of open vegetation is in the oldest part of the core. And due to the high amount of charcoal, um, it can be assumed that strong natural wildfires in the early Holocene, uh, which were typical for the time and uh, also have been proven in other areas, um, may have kept these areas open. Nevertheless, the Maya was surrounded by a pine dominated forest. Between 4,500 years and 3,000 years BCE, the Siberian fir, linden, oak, and elm entered uh, the region and slowly started to establish as a new floristic element. Um, this change in species composition um, gave the pine forest a more hemiboreal character, as we know them today, and this may explain the decrease of the tiger biome score. Uh, this immigration of broadleaf trees, uh, like lime, uh, indicates the warm Metallocene climate. During the second maximum of open vegetation indicators around 2000 years, BCE, pine and spruce decline, where other species show an increasing trend, which might indicate selective deforestation of the Garinskaya culture. Uh, the low charcoal peak might indicate the anthropogenic in activity in the wider surrounding of the Maya. Um, therefore, a beginning uh, intensification of the anthropogenic shaping of the landscape um, yeah, must be assumed from this period onwards at latest. At uh, 700 years BCE, uh, first pollen grains of oat occurred, together with indicators for grazing and livestock farming and uh, further deforestation activities. This might uh, be caused by a local population of um, early Ananino culture, which existed in general from the 8th to the 3rd century BCE. The third major opening of the landscape started around uh, 300 years CE when the anthropogenic pressure on the envi environment became vigorous. And the deforestation and burning activity was common from 300 years CE onwards. Um, the agricultural activity is visible at uh, 100 years CE with rye cultivation and uh, at 500 years CE with rye and barley cultivation which correlate with the Gladenovo cultural horizon. Uh, the signals of coprophyll fungi, uh, in, which indicate livestock for farming um, of this culture is uh, quite strong. Yeah. Um, 1,300 years CE and 1,500 years CE, pollen grains of barley, buckwheat and oat occur, which might belong to the Rodanovo culture and Volgo Bulgarian fur traders. During the last 500 years, the landscape yeah, was apparently open due to anthropogenic impact. Um, our data prove a pine forest uh, from the late to mid Holocene, which developed into a mixed forest during the mid Holocene. Um, Hemiboreal forest was strong, um, anthropogenic disturbance and deforestation occurred during the last 2000 years. So this landscape was formed due to a combination of severe human impact on the environment since the Iron Age and locally strong dryness due to intense water runoff and drainage of the karst bedrock where forest could not establish on the hilly sides. 
So to conclude, uh, the pollen data reveal a more open character of the Congo forest steppe in comparison to a typical northern hemiboreal forest, indicating a leading role of the geology in the veg vegetation history. Uh, the landscape phases correlate with more intense fire regimes, higher erosion and grazing, presumably caused by these uh, human activities since at least 4000 years BP, with strongest uh, impact since the Iron Age. Uh, its modern appearance uh, with this uh, betula and pinus corgi uh, developed during the last 500 to 300 years. At last, I will show you a subsequent project which is planned uh, in order uh, to gain a better understanding of this development of the Iron Age cultures with the focus of their adaptation, migration and transformation in this changing environment. Yeah, it's already known that the Ananino culture transformed into the Gladenovo culture between the 5th and 4th century BCE, and the Gladenovo culture split it into the Rumavatovo culture, which migrated uh, northwards into the Hemiboreal forests, and also split it into the Nivolino culture, which inhabited the forest steppe area in the south of the Kama River. And therefore, this project will investigate the development uh, and transformation of this cultural horizon and their context to the environmental changes during the time. This will include, for instance, uh, archaeobotanical, paleoecological and anthropological investigations. And now I will hand over to Katerina, who will take you to the Eastern European forest step. Um. It's a common knowledge that um, ecotones, which situated on the, which situate, which are situated on the borders between the biomes, are the most sensitive uh, uh, places, regions for the environmental uh, change. Uh, so, East European step, forest step is one of such ecotones. So, I'm going to talk about this region. Uh, this investigation, this research is. Uh, a PhD project is a part of a PhD project, uh, Holocene Dynamics of the East European Forest Steppe, Climate, Fire and Human Impact, funded by um, DFG. Um, yeah, so Forest Steppe. It is situated in the south of the huge East European plain. Forest Steppe Ecotone is a, is a transitional zone between mixed broadleaf forests to the north and steppe in the south. Um, Today, uh, East European forest steppe is an agricultural landscape with very few remains of its former natural vegetation. Uh, due to its favorable climate, uh, Asian peoples prefer this area for living, so it has been populated for decades of thousands of years. Uh, this region has rich uh, civilization history reflecting life, uh, development and extinction of ancient peoples. Uh, the territory is important uh, not just from the historical point of view. Uh, due to its climate, it has been one of the main grain districts of the humanity. Um, so, social, economical, and political lives of such uh, of all the East European countries, including such a huge country as Russia, depends on it. Um, so, this region also is famous for the most fertile soils in the world, uh, known as chernozooms. Uh, the climate characteristics of the region are presented on the slide. Uh, so we can see that the climate is not uh, distribute is not uh, even uh, throughout the whole territory. Um, so it's transitional from moderately humid to insufficiently humid in, in the steppe. Uh, winter, winter in the west is more mild uh, compared to the winter in the east, although the summer is warm throughout the whole territory, and the precipitation Precipitation is not um, distributed uh, evenly as well, so it's more wet in the west than in the east. Um, yeah, uh, the dominant forest-forming species in the south, uh, in the East European forest steppe, is oak. Um, uh, Poesy and the variety of grasses uh, prevail in the steppes of the zone. Um, the 
region can be characterized by extremely rich floristic composition since it's situated on the border of two biomes, as forest and steppe, containing both the species of both of the biomes. Um, the, side, the, side I'm, the study site I'm going to talk about is situated in the center, in the central part, and uh, this is the study site Zamoestia. Um, uh, there were numerous archaeological investigations in the region, uh, which provided the list of 148 uh, study sites, archaeological sites, including one 118 settlements and uh, 41, 41 burial grounds. Yeah. Um, uh, the presence of humans in the region is known since early or mid Paleolithic, and uh, settlement activity was the highest in the Bronze, bronze Age uh, of the on the bronze, bronze Age of the forest in Forest Steppe, um, with 64 known settlements. Uh, this number decreased through the whole periods. Uh, to two settlements in migration period, by the end of migration period. Um, then again, in the Middle Ages and during the Kievan Rus period, uh, it increased. And after a period of, of, of abandonment uh, the territory, of the territory due to the danger from the nomad tribes, uh, the settlement process started again in the 17th century. Um, at, the, at the point that uh, the the region was included in the, into the Moscow state. Uh, the sediment core of Mostia was taken from the silted Oxbow Lake in the Suja River Basin uh, in the southwest of the Kursk Oblast in Russia. Um, it is close to Russian-Ukrainian border, and um, yeah, the majority of the area today is covered by the agricultural landscape. There were a few other palynological studies of the area, of the region, mostly in the north of the area. And all of them showed um, that the territory was covered um, in the mixed broadleaf forest uh, with some patches of grasslands in some areas. Also, anthropogenic disturbance uh, could be seen already since the Middle Holocene. Uh, I must say that uh, all of the studies covered the period, the time periods of uh, seven, not early, earlier than 7,000 years before present. Uh, um, um is on the opposite side, much older, and uh, uh, it consists of two parts. Uh, the main part that was studied uh, was the Mostia II, uh, which has, which is longer, with the uh, part of the Mostia the first, the upper part, which is absent, sadly, in the second core. Uh, we studied this following proxy, including pollen, non-pollen polynomorphs, uh, charcoal, LOE, which estimates organic and carbonate content, and also macrofossils. Uh, this is the age depth model of the core. Um, the um, dating was provided by a radiocarbon uh, laboratory in Poland, and estimated core age is almost 15,000 years, which means that it covers a late glacial period. Uh, this slide presents the pollen diagram of the core. Mm, we can see that um, the area is dominated by arboreal pollen, tree pollen, um, mainly by pine, you know, dipoxylon type, and among herbs, uh, the dominance belongs to Poesia, Sicoriidae is part of Asterazzo family, and also Artemisia. So let's start with the lower part of the cryogram, uh, representing the late glacial period. Um, so statistically, uh, the pollen diagram was divided into three parts, um, which were um, which corresponds to the last three phases of uh, last glacial, late glacial. Uh, the lowest. Um, the lowest part uh, cor is, corresponds to the older driest period, um, even though the last two samples of the core do not do not have sufficient counts. Even though um, uh, we can see the increase of herbs in Poesia, Artemisia, uh, Henopodiaceae, and Sicuriodea, 
as well as decreasing tree taxa. So likely it represents the cold stadial phase with not enough sufficient precipitation. Uh, the next phase, um, in the next phase, we can see the increase in tree taxa. So, which means that probably the conditions were warmer or better, and it corresponds with the interstadial period of aleroid oscillation of late Pleistocene. Um, then we can see the return to stadial conditions and the dominance of herbs uh, like Artemisia poesia and Hedopodiaceae as well as sharp decrease in tree taxa, especially in pine, uh, likely due to drier and colder climate conditions. And uh, this, air, this uh, part of pollen diagram corresponds with the younger dryers period of late glacial. Uh, now let's, take, let's have a look with the Holocene part of the um, diagram. Yeah. Uh, so, um, during almost all of the period, um, the area was dominated by mixed uh, broadleaf, fine broadleaf forest. Um, uh, the most dominant tree taxa are pinus, fine, fine pinus dipoxylon type, uh, with uh, uh, broadleaf species such as Quercus, Tilia, Vitovulmus, and Coriolus, and also Almus. Almus. Um, yeah. So, uh, the broadleaf forest conditions are also supported by the abundance of uh, monoletal ferns, spores, which we can see in abundance in the, in the diagram. Uh, but the main changes in the Holocene happened in the last 600, of year, 600 years, according to the diagram. There was likely to be a hiatus uh, between 2,000 years before present and 600 years. Uh, before present, which corresponds with the 14th century. Um, yeah. So the processes of differentiation can be seen, so re seen already since the 14th century as a result of uh, Kiev and Rus uh, settlements. Then we can see, yeah, then we can see a small phase of abandonment of the territories, probably due to the um, uh, Norman, the attacks danger of from the Norman tribes, and then we can see that uh, from the 17th century and on, uh, the processes of uh, deforestation continues, continue, and uh, um, this uh, period is also accompanied by the appearance of some agricultural crops such as uh, wheat, um, triticum, as well as fagopirum, buckwheat, and um, avena. Um, yeah. So, one second, sorry. Yeah. Uh, since that period, um, the processes of deforestation and the transformation of the area into agricultural landscapes um, are clearly visible. Now let's have a look on the NTP diagram. Mm. We can see that initially, so this NTP diagram can show us the local conditions of the core. So we can see that initially this core was probably, uh, this place was probably a lake, uh, which can be about what uh, we are told by algae, the abundance of algae, and also water plants, plants remains. Um, um, throughout the whole history, but the last um, period of time, the last 600 years. Uh, another interesting thing is uh, the abundance of the peak of charcoal in the beginning of younger driest period, which could represent, could, could or might uh, represent the, one of the theories of uh, younger driest, uh, the volcano, uh, Lachesea volcano in Germany eruption, um, which happened in the beginning of Younger Dryas, as well as that it might show the dry conditions in that period. In the last, in the last 600 years, we can see that the amount of algae 
uh, decreases significantly, which shows the degradation of the lake. Uh, and we can see the amount of the increase in fungi, especially in glomus, showing uh, soil erosion processes. And in the last 150 years, uh, there are findings of nematoda, uh, trichinus, trichinus, yeah, that uh, could show us the probably the pastoral land use in the area. Yeah, so uh, Corza Mostia uh, contains unique for the studied area data on the less glacial uh, climate and vegetation. Um, the period was statistically divided into three phases uh, that likely to correspond with the last uh, three phases of late glacial. Throughout the Holocene, the site was dominated by mixed broadleaf forests, um, fine broadleaf forests with the following species. And um, the dominant uh, taxa among herbs um, are Poaceae, Artemisia, and Cicoriodea. According to the study of um, the forest steppe area has an anthropogenic origin in this place um, because it was so the major vegetation changes um, here occur just due to the human disturbance. Yeah, so deforestation processes started just in the last 600 years, and um, the changes in the spectra correspond with the historical events of the place. And nowadays, the site has agricultural landscape. This is it. Thank you for your attention.